All right, good morning and welcome back from Long Labor Day weekend, Phenom Group Traders. It is Tuesday morning. I hope everybody had an opportunity to read this, this weekend special report from Merrill Lynch. If you haven't, give it some time here today. Makes for a pretty good read. If you haven't watched the weekly state of the market with us Thursday or Friday of last week, do check it out. It's a short trading week. Um, some of the data with respect to the Tuesday and Wednesday after Labor Day doesn't point uh, favorably for the markets. Uh, but when it comes to those kind of seasonality data points, uh, this market has largely uh, ignored them for much of the year. No April showers, no June swoon, no August peak and trough. You know, we're up now seven months in a row. Will September be the eighth month higher in a row? Remains to be seen. What we do know is that the data is favorable. And again, we talked about this in the weekly state of the market. Equity futures relatively flat here this morning with the VIX pointed nicely higher. Of course, that is predicated upon the weekly VIX reset that usually happens on Monday, but of course, uh, we'll look at it as the first trading of trading day of the week, the VIX, you get the the, uh, the calendar reset off of lowered options bids the previous Friday, and you also have the automatic weekly hedging programs that go into place. So VIX is typically up on Monday, at least through the lunch period, and typically down on Fridays as those automatic weekly hedges roll off. We do have a bid in bond yields today, a pretty nice bid at that. So let's check that out really quickly here. Uh, just off the highs of the session, we had been up just about five basis points here on the 10 year yield. Coming into the day, let's see what we got in the way of the yield curve. Uh, modest, very modest deepening at 112. So if we just look at last week real quickly here, spread between the 10 year and two year. You know, it seems rather flat. It's not making um, great progress so far, steepening the yield curve, but modest progress nonetheless. And from that low that we saw in basically mid July, where we did in fact break the 100 point barrier to the downside. But ever since then, that's proven support. And uh, yields have sloshed around a lot. We don't really get into um, the bond sell-off season until next month. That's not till October, right? And you can kind of fashion why, right? The fourth quarter, you typically do. That is typically very good for equities. The best um, place to start is obviously November, which kicks off the best six months to own equities or own the market from November through April. But when it comes to the bond market seasonality, uh, typically you see the bond market sell, start to see selling pressure uh, in October, which means bond prices go down, yields go higher. So we got a decent uh, sell off going on in bonds here today, pushing yields higher. Asia overnight, good session there gaining another uh, nearly nine tenths of a percent on the Nikkei after being up like two plus percent last Friday. Nice move here on the Hang Seng, Kospi not doing much of anything there. Gold this morning getting beat up pretty good here, down 20 bucks, a troy ounce. Oil getting beat up as well. So commodities under pressure here today. Again, a very shortened holiday trading week. Do keep that in mind. As far as the calendar is concerned with respect to economic data coming out this week, here's Tuesday, of course. We have nothing scheduled. Tomorrow, we're going to get another look at the labor market. Last week's unemployment uh, report uh, or non farm payroll report, extremely underwhelming. Uh, you know, if you just look at it, uh, for the headline itself, growing just 200 plus thousand jobs against economist expectations of 700,000 plus, it, it was a pretty abysmal report. 
the revisions to the prior two months were just a little over 100,000 jobs as well, positive revisions. Um, you know, the narrative at this point is, you know, goes back to the Fed. You know, here you can see in the bulletin from Mark, you watch that taper, that pe pessimism. Barkley says Fed's actions won't derail U.S. stocks. Um, so if we think about, well, what we've been talking about for several months in the whole will they, won't they begin tapering and will uh, or when <laughs> will they actually deliver the message on tapering plans? I've long since been of the opinion September would prove a very bad month to do so. It doesn't, uh, doesn't hold a lot of logic. You have two key fiscal policy programs rolling off in the month of September, those being the eviction moratorium as well as the um, additional un unemployment insurance benefits, both rolling off. We have no data for, you know, obviously, rolling off in September. We don't have any data to support Fed messaging, let alone activity uh, for tapering asset purchases uh, post a extreme you know, fiscal policy program all of a sudden ending. I think that you know, the Fed has been put in a very good position. It's been given cover, if you will. Uh, with respect to the latest non-farm payroll report. Um, you know, it being very underwhelming um, and the Fed's messaging, you know, what would cause the Fed, what would allow the Fed uh, to deliver their message, their plans for tapering, and then of course tapering, one of their key mantras has been further substantial progress. Further substantial progress. One on inflation, which has been achieved. I don't think anybody can argue against the fact that the inflation mandate has been achieved and then some in this current post-pandemic economic backdrop. Uh, when it comes to you know, the, the unemployment or maximum employment mandate from the Fed, you can make the argument that has not been achieved. We were on a pretty good trend coming into the August non-farm payroll report release. We had two consecutive months of eight and 900 plus thousand um, jobs being created. And then, yeah, fell on our face, so to speak. So that gives the Fed cover to hold off. Again, there's not a lot of logic to, to a message tapering and risk a market schism alongside unemployment insurance benefits ending and the eviction moratorium ending. So I think the Fed is going to wait. They have the September FOMC meeting, which start, which, um, um, you know, they deliver their no change to uh, the Fed fund rate on September 22nd. And of course, their Fed statement and outlook for the economy will coincide on that date with Jerome Powell's, uh, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell's uh, press conference at 2.30 on, on September 22nd, or that Wednesday if my day is off. Um, so yeah, I think they're just going to hold, you know, hold down the fort, give themselves another month to see if the September you know, payroll report comes in better, uh, shows a rebound. Maybe there's even a big revision to the August report, uh, but also there'll be that much further distance from uh, the Delta wave uh, in the South, it's subsiding, but there's anticipation, of course, for the Delta wave to pick up in the Northeast. Getting into those winter months here, folks. So again, in terms of uh, jobs data this, uh, this week, we're looking at job openings tomorrow. That's the JOLT survey, job opening, labor turnover survey, JOLTS. Right now we're at record levels. <laughs> I mean, there's jobs out there, folks. It's just a matter of, you know, until those uh, unemployment insurance benefits roll off, um, you know, folks are still, you know, many, many service industry participants. Uh, it's not just that, you know, there's a fear of the Delta variant, but there's a, they're also to some degree being disincentivized from going back to work, given that their, uh, their pay from the unemployment insurance benefits is substantial. 
Beige Book also comes out tomorrow. That's at two o'clock. Nobody cares about consumer credit. Thursday, of course, jobless claims. And Friday, we'll get the first you know, monthly read of August inflation data via the producer price index or PPI. Let's see. Yeah, I wanted to see when the retail sales report comes out. There it is. Okay, so not this week, but next week, right? Because right now we're hearing a lot of, and we're seeing the data, that, you know, has supported, uh, to some degree, has supported fears of an, you know, a more robust or a bigger downturn. Deceleration, I think is the best word. A deceleration of economic growth from a peak economic growth in the Q2 period to lesser growth in the Q3 period here. Uh, but in the way of uh, re retail sales will go a long way towards um, giving us a better gauge on how much of a slowdown, how much of a deceleration in, in the economy we've seen. Uh, based on Red Book Johnson retail sales, which come out every week, it's not that robust. It really isn't. Uh, the former retail sales from uh, July was a month over month decline of 1.1%. But as I've said before, I think a lot of it, a lot of that decline had to do with um, folks receiving and then spending their first <clears throat> childcare tax credits, right? That showed up in June with a really big climb. Like as soon as those checks were received, we've seen the data suggesting a big climb uh, in, in retail sales, but it dropped off immediately. Once that check was basically used up, you know, here we are, a big climb. We got the check here, the first one, child care tax credits climbed, dropped right off when it was over. But then we got the check again, it was off to the races. And what happens? down until we get the next check and off to the races. So I think a lot of the weakness here, and still, yeah, relative to this period here, um, is just about the check and not so much the Delta variant. Remember, we were still locked down you know, last year in July. To a, you know, to a goodly degree, the company was re, the, the country was reopening, but it was nowhere near at full strength. And yet what happened with retail sales? We basically climbed to a record high in retail sales in July last year. That's still with a significant portion of the economy shut down with COVID. So we have a delta wave now, but we, you know, we have a hundred million people vaccinated. I don't think this is, I think in, there are certain industries that are getting affected like air travel, like hospitality, leisure, the service industries. Um, but in terms of consumption, I don't think we're seeing the impact that a lot of the financial media networks would have us believe. So retail sales next week, not this week, unfortunately. Yeah. By and large, this week's economic calendar is quite light. Again, no economic data today. Tomorrow, jolts. Thursday, initial jobless claims. Friday, producer price index. All right. So again, oil's taking a hit here this morning. Bond yields. Trying to get back to their best levels of the day. Europe this morning, under some pressure, not much, but you know, very lackluster trading week um, for you know, most of Europe last week. Our indices largely up across the board with the Dow Jones being the laggard last week. Crypto this morning, down 1,000 there on Bitcoin. The dollar's got a bit of a bid here this morning, up 31 cents. Tried to break through 92 last Friday, narrowly failed. But would be anticipating that break below here this week though. All right, again, a look at our futures here this morning, Apple. 
There's that 155 handle there. Netflix this morning upgraded. Again, reached all time high levels last week. Still climbing here this morning. We'll see where the appetite for risk you know, is held or is found here today with S&P 500 basically you know, just about at all time highs, the all time high for the S&P. Let's see where we're coming into this week. You can do it, think or swim. All right. <laughs> all time high, 45, 45 RSI coming into the day, 14 day, 66. So indeed, you know, momentum is pretty strong. We haven't quite touched 70 since July there. So that may still yet be a bullish feat of strength that needs to be accomplished before we get the next one, two, three, four percent, who knows, draw down in the market, that modest pullback that we've been getting here frequently all year long. Uh, breath looks good. Uh, one of our favorite breath studies and looking at the NYSE, very broad index, includes bonds, bond funds, stocks, stock funds, etc. cetera. Um, but this is the NYSE, stocks above their 200-day moving average relative to their 50-day moving, stocks above their 50-day moving average. When the line is going down, as you see it is here, the interim breath is very, is strengthening. We, as of Friday, we took a bounce off the line here, which goes all the way back to January of this year, which tells us the last two weeks, you know, the interim breath has been about the strongest it's been all year long. Last two weeks, it tells us a lot about participation. We've seen the market broaden out. More stocks are, you know, trading above their 50 and 200 day moving average. So. What this might, might also point to is, do you think breath will get any stronger from here? Like, <laughs> again, it seems to uh, get to this level. And you know, then we see some weakness in the stocks trading above their 50-day moving average relative to their 200-day moving average. When that happens, the interim breath weakens, the long-term breath takes over. So you might think about rebalancing here. Is the market defensive? Is it offensive? I would still make the argument that the market's defensive. Last week with the S&P 500 up yet again, uh, I think it was up in a defensive manner. Let me see. Our gain for the S&P 500 last week only 0.15. So just like Europe, <laughs> our market didn't do a whole heck of a lot. However, um, the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ was up 0.64% last week. Which, you know, NASDAQ tech heavy, healthcare heavy, those are defensive areas of the market. Yes, tech is offensive as well. Tech is everything. But in terms of you know, generally having predictable long-term outcomes, tech is defensive. It's where the greatest visibility of future earnings come from, technology. So you might think about rebalancing here, locking in profits. S&P 500 long-term market breadth was much weaker in September of 2020. We've talked about this chart before as well, kind of just a refresher, you know, in terms of you know, what's going to cause a bigger correction. You know, we talked about in the past, um, there's usually two things. It's either the conditions are right for a correction or there's a catalyst that simply, you know, uh, produces that bigger drawdown. Quite frankly, the conditions just haven't been there. Again, you know, the NYSE breath study that we just looked at, those are not the right conditions for a bigger drawdown. In terms of the S&P 500, stocks above their 200-day moving average right now, more than 75% of stocks above their 200-day moving average. 
don't get scared of the alligator jaws because those are beautiful alligator jaws, by the way. It's almost perfect. Um, you know, from extreme breath levels, that's all you're going to get is a deceleration in, in you know, this particular breath room mastery. You're not going to stay up here forever. 95% of stocks above their 200-day moving average. That would be unhealthy. That would be an unhealthy bull market <laughs> if we had this many stocks above their long-term 200-day moving average all the way out here. That would be a everything bubble. This is normal and to be expected, right? Off of extreme breath, you get normalized long-term breath. But in terms of the conditions, you know, are they ripe for a bigger drawdown? We can go back to September of last year when the market did have a 10% plus correction, not on a closing basis, but on an intraday basis. Had a 10% correction. Look at long-term breath right here. We're starting September. We yeah, had just about 65% maybe. 65% of stocks above their 200-day moving average. We've been in the 80s and upper 70s for the last couple months here, folks. So the long-term breath is more supportive today of shallower, shallower um, pullbacks than it was last year. The conditions, conditions just aren't there for a bigger drawdown. A catalyst may be needed to offset some of these healthy, strong breath con you know, considerations. Um, this is the relative performance ratio of consumer discretionary stocks versus consumer staples. A minute ago I said, or I asked, is the market more defensive or offensive at this time? The market is leaning still towards technology, healthcare, NASDAQ. That was the outperformer last couple of weeks. Right here shows us last week, even with the S&P 500 slightly higher, uh, investors favored um, staples over consumers, uh, over consumer discretionary, consumer staples over consumer discretionary. And this is the equal weight version of consumer discretionary versus consumer staples, equal weight. We do equal weight because three stocks make up more than 50% of the consumer discretionary ETF, that being um, Amazon number one, Tesla number two, Home Depot number three. So yeah, when you have a cap, a cap heavy or a cap weighted uh, ETF, it doesn't lend itself well to truly understanding uh, the, you know, the performance of the, the underlying, if you will, holdings in the XLY. There you go. Amazon, Tesla, Home Depot. Add them up. 36, 37, and 9. 46% of the consumer discretionary ETF is just those three stocks. You add in Nike and you're at 50%. So using the equal weight version of consumer discretionary versus consumer staples is optimal to really understanding you know, whether or not investors are defensive or offensive minded. As of last week, last couple weeks even, here is the peak basically in mid mid-September and consumer discretionary has been underperforming consumer staples. Come back to this. Here's the tech ETF flows. I mean, look at this massive spike. It really funneling money into the technology sector. Here is the chart, Tuesday, Wednesday, after Labor Day. 
Stock Traders Almanac, and here's Tuesday for the Dow. Average return going back to 2000. <laughs> S&P, <laughs> Tuesday for the NASDAQ is the worst. It has a lot more beta, obviously. The only one with a positive gain going back to 2000 is the Russell Small Cap Index. But the percent of the time it's up is only 52%. Wednesday, better. After Labor Day, the Wednesday, better for the Dow, and it's up 76% of the time. Better for the S&P, but the win rate sucks. It's under 50. Under 50% 50 of the time is the S&P 500 up the Wednesday after Labor Day. NASDAQ, it's positive also, but you know it's a coin toss. Positive on the Russell as well. A little better than a coin toss. So I wouldn't have, you know, high expectations here over the next couple of days. Again, that's just one data point. The seasonal factors, as they often say, should be paired you know, with other data. This is, look at this growth in Walmart's grocery e-commerce sales. Walmart is now the number one online grocer, overtaking uh, Amazon as of last year. Amazon still number two, um, number three, technically for you know delivery because it is e-commerce. It's Instacart. Uh, even though they're not a grocer, they're a grocery delivery service provider. And that's the billions of dollars that Instacart is basically servicing. It's a pretty good trend that, well, it's not good business, don't get me wrong. I mean, the margins suck. <laughs> the margins really suck for Walmart. Uh, I mean, grocery by itself, just as a standalone grocer. The margins, you're lucky if you have, you know, uh, upper teens to low 20% gross margins. There's a lot of waste. There's a lot of um, vendor credits. There's a lot of, uh, you know, Merchandise that gets thrown away, expired, no good. That's why the grocery business is a very, very difficult business. You throw on top of that transportation from e-commerce grocery business, the transportation cost, yeah. again, it's a very tough business. But clearly, based on Walmart's growth on a year-over-year -year basis, in their five-year stack comps. Um, it's a growing business. They have the dominant market share at 25% of e-commerce grocery now, 25%. All right, equity put call ratio, as you can see here, coming into the week, we are at 0.50, nice round number, but this is elevated. It is still elevated, um, both on you know, a one-year, and 200 day moving average basis, as you can see. There's a 200 day moving average, 0.50. So you're still hedging. We are still at all time highs in the S&P 500. Seems like the longer you know, we stay at these levels, people are more than content, more than contented to hedge their downside risk. And of course the problems with that is you know, how do you maintain that position? And even if it becomes profitable, look at the tax you're going to. You're not, you don't just run the risk of the hedge not working out and taxing your potential profits, but you're going to take a, you know, the, the, the excess capital gains tax on the hedge if it's profitable because you're only hedging for a short duration. Hedging just has so many illogical points of reference when you consider it. Having cash on the sidelines, I've always found to be the best hedge against downside. Not that you know my cash is going to stop the downside, but it helps you to take advantage of price weakness when the market breathes in. 
you know, buying those stocks and ETFs on your shopping list at even better valuations. Assuming again, nothing has changed in the, in the, in the long-term economic outlook or the earnings picture. Um, you know, with last week's underwhelming non-farm payroll report, ADP private sector payroll report, I think folks lose sight of one very important fact, and that is this particular uh, post-recession uh, jobs recovery is among the fastest in history. Yeah, don't forsake a good jobs recovery for a perfect jobs recovery. We say that when it comes to trading, right? Don't forsake a good entry hoping for that perfect entry. Again, we can say the same thing about many aspects of the economic recovery, many economic data points. This is among the fastest jobs recovery in history post a recession. I mean, you know, we're not, nothing goes up in a straight line. We're gonna have our, our setbacks and our reacceleration. Goldman Sachs lowering their economic outlook for the Q3 period and Q4 period based on a lot of the normalized, what I call normalization of the economic data. But they also believe that there's going to be a reacceleration in the fourth quarter. And I'm sure, you know, if Delta doesn't cooperate, they'll have to rethink that. If we get, you know, child, uh, an FDA emergency use uh, vaccination for children, what's the catalyst, right? We talked about this last week. What's the catalyst from the, for the S&P 500 from here? Well, number one is always earnings. That's what the market follows. We won't get Q3 earnings, of course, until November. But that's always your number one catalyst. It tells you what to do when markets do pull back. Are earnings still growing, yet I get a better value for the stocks on my, on my shopping list? Okay. That's the information that helps me to execute. But so far as additional catalysts, this market may even find a catalyst at the September FOMC meeting if Jerome Powell doesn't utter the plans for Fed tapering program. And third, for some reason, we understood an FDA approval for emergency use approval back in January for a vaccine was going to be a huge catalyst for the market all of a sudden we forgot that just because it's a possibility for children under the age of 12. Usually it's what nobody's looking for, right? We talk about catalysts. Well, what could be, you know, what could catalyze the downside? It's usually something we're not thinking about. What could catalyze the upside? It's usually something nobody's talking about. Don't get me wrong, people are talking about you know, getting a vaccine for children by the end of this year. But not with respect to market performance. So as the market continues and has been just trending higher with these very small pullbacks over the last two quarters now, I think the market has some of these, some of these things on its mind, if you will if it was a animated object. And now we see futures have tilted back in the red. Again, just modestly lower here in and around the unchanged levels there for the S&P and NASDAQ futures. VIX is still up nicely and actually trending higher. UVXY, VXX this morning. Uh, again, I hope everybody had a great Labor Day weekend. We'll be back on schedule with our weekly research reports this Sunday.
Walmart. Verizon, we carried over three, eh, I think three trades from last week. We have TJ Maxx on the board. Uh, we still have one position in Verizon on the board, which I want to talk about a little bit. Uh, and we started a position in a blue chip bank slash financial stock, JP Morgan. Again, with yields nicely higher here this morning, 10-year yield up almost five basis points. We usually do see the financials, small caps with a bid. And JP Morgan's bid up about 50 cents here in the pre-market, we'll call it. We still have one position on Pepsi as well in the money, but and we've collected the dividend. Well, we qualified for the dividend last week. Heads up also last week, Verizon increased their dividend from 62 to 64 cents, 64 plus cents. It's like a fraction, <laughs> 64 plus cents a share, um, which, you know, they increased their dividend last year too. You know, through the pandemic, they still increased their dividend, interestingly enough. Uh, Twitter here this morning. Eh, we'll see how that opens. Wide bid ask spread. Facebook. In terms of the Fang names, Apple now back under 155, but you know outperforming Nasdaq, outperforming tech, Microsoft, outperforming Microsoft. We've seen Apple outperform Microsoft for a little more than a week now, which was also our expectation. TQs eh, slightly under pressure here this morning. Again, not much you know, movement here up, you know, above or below uh, the unchanged line in futures markets at this time. All right, so last week, <laughs> last week we heard from Stephanie Link, uh, Hightower Advisors Fund Manager. Um, she actually took that role last year leaving uh, Jim Cramer in the street. And she says she likes AT&T. Now, we've talked about AT&T here in the past at Phenom Group, and I've constantly said, I don't like it. I don't like the debt structure. The debt structure is very different from Verizon. The absolute debt to equity is different from Verizon. Verizon being, having a better balance sheet, let's put it that way. Here's the five-year chart, speaks for itself. Like, what the heck do you like better about AT&T? She made the same similar, you know, comparison when on CNBC uh, between Pepsi and Coca-Cola. By the way, the charts don't look any different. Pepsi over Coca-Cola. Pepsi has doubled the return of Coca-Cola over the last five years. But she likes Coca-Cola over Pepsi. Didn't make any sense to me. It is what it is. But in saying that you like AT&T, and she owns AT&T, you know, these are disclosures that show up on the, the uh, CNBC side box, if you will. Um, why you're in this name is beyond me. And don't get me wrong, Verizon is down 5.5% year to date in 2021. Verizon's had a bad year too. Not as bad, <clears throat> clearly not as bad as AT&T. But over five years, like what are you doing owning this stock? It has a bigger dividend. It has to have a bigger dividend if it's gonna get anybody attracted. I think it's about one and a half percent annual. Uh, spread between Verizon, maybe close to 2% spread between Verizon's dividend and AT&T's dividend. But man, have you had to suffer and even uh, just a tremendous drawdown in this stock for a long time. And I, and I kind of compare it again with her favoring Coca-Cola over Pepsi. And I got to say to myself, some fund managers just like dogfights. They just do. They like the underdog and they want to fight. Because the fundamentals just aren't there for AT&T when you have an alternative. Alternative could have been Verizon for Hightower Advisors. 
the alternative could be Pepsi for Hightower Advisors for Stephanie Ling. She's choosing otherwise for whatever reason. She's choosing otherwise. Now, we've got you know basically four months left in the calendar year. We've looked at a number of breath charts already here this morning. And the S&P 500 is up 20 per 20, almost 21% year to date, not including the dividend. NASDAQ up about 19% year to date. Now, our data, what we you know, identify in our weekly state of the market for Phenom Group members, suggests drawdowns are going to be muted, regardless of the fact that the indices are up double digits. Drawdowns are going to be muted based on the historical data. But does that mean that the market is going to just continue at this torrid pace? We already slowed down last week. We were up a measly 0.15% in the S&P 500 last week. How do you want to be positioned for September? How do you want to be positioned going into the fourth quarter? I'm of the opinion that you can accomplish a wide variety of EQ, emotional quotient, um, feats of strength based on rebalancing your portfolio here in September and ahead of the fourth quarter holiday season. And one of the ways I think I want to do that for the Golden Capital Portfolio is indeed, no secret, with Verizon, right? It's a matter of where are you year to date? So I can't recommend this for everybody. We've done very well with Verizon year to date. The stock is down five and a half percent. But we have seven completed trades of more than 1%. We have a core holding going all the way back to 2019. We've done a good 30 plus trades over that period of time and collected the dividend now for a third year in the Golden Capital Portfolio at 4.5% and it's almost 5% annual dividend. The, the dividend basically makes up for the year to date loss with a few extra trades. And why a few extra trades? Like this is the point. You know, people can make things complicated or simple for themselves. What have we seen out of Verizon quarterly reports? You can go back to last year, even during the pandemic. Beats, 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 beats. And finally, as of the most recently reported quarter, they raised guidance. Beats on subscriptions, beats on, on revenues, beats on earnings, right? And the stock underperforms the broader market by 25, almost 26% this year. Like, this is not a buy in hold without recognizing the fundamentals, the technicals. They don't tell you anything. Looking at the five-year chart here, look at these peaks and valleys. What the hell? <laughs> you know, I can put up the 200-day moving average. I can put up the 50-day moving average. This will be below the 200-day moving average with no cause. As again, beats, 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 and yet still falls below the 50 and 200-day moving average periodically. There's the 50, which it's under right now. Maybe it's going to go up there and tag it at 55.72, maybe it breaks above it. Two hundred day moving average, all the way up there. Again, beats, 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 beats. Dividend is juicy, but if you're only buying and holding the stock, you've underperformed even with the dividend. You're almost back to even with the dividend if you hold it for the year and it doesn't produce anything more 
than a 5% drawdown. You're basically at even. But man, if you know the fundamentals, right? If you know that the company has beaten and beaten subscriber growth, it beats every quarter, it beats on revenues, it's beating on earnings, it raised guidance, you can trade around your core holding with the utmost confidence. Right, because nobody wants utilities, nobody generally wants telecom, telecommunication stocks like Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile. That's not where, you know, the juiciness of the market is. They want tech, they want FANG, they want some consumer discretionary, they want some retail, they want some next gen, you know, FinTech, chip stocks, semiconductors, et cetera. There's nothing sexy about Verizon. But again, if you know the fundamentals and you can buy the dips and sell the rips, 1% scalps, buy the dips, sell the rips, buy the dips, sell the rips, buy the dips, sell the rips. Oh, but I bought here and it went even lower. Buy even lower and sell the rips. Goes back down, buy the dip, sell the rip. And now you're higher than when you cried about buying here. And yet, still, buy the dip, sell the rips. You could have done this time and time and time again. Just looking for a 1% scalp within days or weeks of you know, bigger drops. Stock generally goes nowhere over time. but this is one of the, literally one of the safest stocks to perform this exercise with. It's literally one of the safest because it's a telco. And we essentially have a monopoly here in the United States. There's three key providers, Sprint, AT&T, and Verizon, generally thought of as the blue chip, the best in breed. It's been making a series of lower lows, right? It's had a death cross, essentially, then that's what we should expect, right? Underperformance after a death cross, where the 50-day moving average crosses below the 200-day moving average. Drops below the 200-day moving average. Oh my gosh, the world is ending, right? Not with safety stocks. Not with telcos. Again, these don't work, but in late inning cycles, you know, of an economic expansion or a bull market, these just don't work. But you can make them work in your portfolio. You can make, I've owned this since 2019. My cost average is right around $37, $38 with upwards of 30 scalps. 1% buying the dip, selling the rip. And I'm getting four and a half to almost 5%, you know, compounding dividend every year. So don't let a chart scare you. It's all about your engagement with the stock and knowing how it trades and why, right? The fundamentals, why? Because this isn't, stocks like this, like Pepsi, consumer staple stocks, Telco, they don't really abide by technicals. It's the long-term fundamentals. I can easily say, well, this is trading in a bullish regime compared to this regime from 2007 to 2018. So from 2019, it's been trading, trading in a higher regime. When you look at the one year chart, that doesn't look, that's not the look you get. That's why I say these stocks don't do anything for long periods of time. Who knows if the next regime is going to be up here or back down here. In terms of rebalancing your portfolio for September, even fourth quarter, 
can look at seasonality for Verizon, right? It's pretty steady eddy, not a whole lot going on. Month of September going back to 2002, the average return is negative a tenth of a percent. The percent of the time it's positive going back to 2002 in the month of September, 55% of the time. Gets a little bit better though for October, November, and December. Look at the return in October, right? The highest volatility month. The median reading is the highest on average since 1990 in the month of October. Defensive. That's Verizon, defensive. And you get a good dividend. Look at the return for October going back to 2002, 3%, 2% in November. Just for comparison's sake, let's look at AT&T. Percent positive is worse at 53 versus Verizon, 58. September's better. It's up 60% of the time going back to 2002 for a net positive gain. But lesser gain, lesser gain, and all of a sudden December proves to be you know, the second most optimistic year next to April for AT&T. Again, something to think about in terms of markets already up 20% for the year. This will be the third double digit year in a row. The market is higher. The risk reward for here, as we know, you know, gets less favorable. Market is starting to trade in a narrower trading range, if you will. Some rebalancing ideas. Uh, I'm probably going to up the weighting in the Golden Capital portfolio for Verizon. Still have that trade on the board at 55.58. Let's see what happens going forward. <laughs>